Hello, hi, my name is Min Wei Li and welcome to Putting Tech to Work. Um, this is a sort of condensed version of my usual uh, masterclass session, so forgive me if I go a little bit quickly. Um, bef but before I dive in, uh, usually when I start these classes, I always ask um, uh, participants this question. What feelings do you experience when you think about technology? Now, I think some of you guys might have answered this um, through email previously. Uh, and the nice thing is that, you know, the people that did respond sort of fell onto the left side of the spectrum, like very excited, you know, um, excited at the sort of potential of uh, what technology can sort of bring to our lives, um, how it can make our workflows more efficient. Um, but, you know, usually when I give these master classes and I ask this question up front, the sort of spectrum that these emotions sort of fall between is sort of between excitement and fear. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because you guys are, you know, younger and more sort of like, you know, have a zest for life and not jaded yet. But um, for some of the people that I have spoken to, they all, there's also a huge element of fear, fear of the unknown, you know, fear that maybe um, the way that technological innovation is going is not exactly, um, you know, it's not really going in a great direction. Um, but basically the reason I sort of start this kind of course with this question is I just want to make it plain that your emotions about technology are quite universal um, and I guarantee you that your audiences also feel similarly and you know so even though we live in a world powered by technology and it's made our lives better in countless ways it's also it's still something that's very unnatural for humans to grapple with. So hopefully today's talk is going to give you guys a better understanding of how to approach technology from a more human centric lens and apply that understanding to the amazing briefs that you guys are going to be working on. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am a freelance experience and innovation creative strategist. Um, my most recent position was at the mill in London, uh, where I focus on developing strategy and creative concepts for interactive and immersive experiences powered by emerging technologies. Uh, I'm Singaporean, born and raised. Um, I studied and worked in New York for eight years before I moved to London. And now I'm kind of a bit of a digital nomad. I split my time between Europe and Singapore. Um, I'm also a jack of all trades before I pivoted into strategy and creative, I was a producer. That's how I started my career. Um, but above all, my first creative discipline um, is film. And that's actually how I, uh, that's how I sort of started, I guess, my sort of creative journey. I never really imagined that I'd be working in emerging technology um, just because I had my heart so set on film. I had formally trained as a filmmaker. Um, I received my bachelor's degree in film and TV from New York University and to this day I'm still you know madly in love with film. I love how the best films can really take me on an emotional journey and put me in someone else's shoes um, and make me feel connected to others and to the world around me. Um, but you know as fate had it I was interning with the Mills live action department and I thought I'd join them after college but Unfortunately, they just didn't have an opening when I graduated, but really wanted to help me out. So they ended up finding me a position um, in the emerging technology or experience department as a coordinator. So, you know, I, being foreign, needing a visa, jumped at the opportunity immediately and was plunged into the very deep end of game engines, artificial intelligence, virtual augmented realities, all the realities. And, you know, I was super out of my depth. My screen was basically constantly split between taking notes and Google because we didn't have ChatGPT back then. And I was just like, you know, typing things like, what is Unreal Game Engine? What is Unity? Because I just, I didn't know. And this was like a completely new world for me. And so remember when I asked you guys earlier how you guys felt about technology? So needless to say, I was very, very intimidated by this world. And, you know, while I was highly stimulated by everything that I was learning and gaining exposure to. I was still very, um, I guess, wary of the dystopian nature of some of the technologies I was uh, learning about. So 
I kind of, I felt like I needed to find connection to the work in order for me to get over this feeling and to truly contribute to projects. Um, and very uh, luckily, that connection came early um, through an amazing project that we did with uh, Magic Leap and the band Sigur Ross. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Magic Leap is an augmented reality headset. Um, and it's like, one, I guess, one of the biggest, biggest competitors with Microsoft's HoloLens. Um, so the, this experience that we ended up building for them was this ethereal alien sort of sound garden, like, you know, all this flora and fauna was just sort of like popping up in your, um, in your personal space. Um, you know, you could run your fingers through the grass and there'd be like scintillating sounds. There'd be like weird jellyfish sort of like floating by you. And if you sort of touch them and guide them somewhere, they would also produce a different sound. So you were kind of like this, um, I don't know, conductor of a sort of otherworldly orchestra. It was very, very cool. Um, so, you know, that was one of the coolest things I'd ever experienced in my life when I'd first put on the headset for the first time. And to me, it was a whole new type of storytelling, one where our spaces played a big role in making our experience of the story unique and personal. Uh, you know, I saw how my movements and my actions directly affected the experience. Um, it was very self-driven, so you moved at your own pace, you lingered on things that you enjoyed, and you moved on from things that you didn't. Um, it was a completely new way of experiencing a story. Um, but I think the biggest draw for me was how much I felt like a child, and the joy, at, the joy that I felt experiencing and exploring something new for the first time. And I think this was an incredible revelation because, you know, I feel like the older we get, the less likely we are to experience this type of pure delight. Um, and I think for me, that's when technology is really being used to its full potential in experiences when it makes you believe in magic, even for just a little while. So I kind of went from intimidated to intrigued. I wanted to see what this new field had to offer and how it could help to create emotional connections, the same emotional connections that I cherish deeply in films. Um, you know, but obviously that this sort of realization didn't assuage the feelings I had before. As technology continues to develop at a breakneck pace, I remain acutely aware of how quickly we can spiral into techno dystopia. Um, you know, when I think about how, like, when I think about the future of AI, for example, I'm a bit worried about how quickly the world and our industry sort of jumped onto this bandwagon without consideration for how our actions could shape the way we engage with this nascent space in the future. So, you know, to techno dystopia. Um, and, you know, we don't have to look too far in the past for examples of how our lack of understanding of a specific type of technology has led to detrimental impacts on society. Like, social media has been around for almost two decades, and we're only just realizing the effects it's having on our mental health, the way we relate to our community, and even to our political institutions. Um, of course, there are, you know, amazing examples of how technology has helped society progress and it definitely holds the key to some of our most urgent challenges. But the point of me bringing up all of these examples really is just to remind us that technology is simply a tool. And as professionals who are, you know, um, we are concerned with creating value for audiences and consumers, we need to keep empathy and people at the heart of our work, especially when new technologies are involved. So uh, the goal for today's talk, I think, is to help you guys understand how to approach technology through a human centric lens and apply this way of thinking um, to your amazing uh, briefs. So if, because technology is just a tool to enhance our experience, we're going to discuss a few key experience design principles that I find useful to keep in mind when creating um, tech-enabled experiences. Um, these principles are actually universal across all kinds of experiences, not just the ones involving creative technologies, but I just find it's useful to keep referencing these three points, these three sort of lenses um, when you're thinking about integrating a specific type of technology, because I find that often we can get caught up in the hype of a specific piece of tech and really forget about its actual relevance to our audience. So this is just a great like checklist. 
Um, so they have the categories, human centric, culturally resonant and community minded. So um, <clears throat> as I go through these sort of buckets, I guess, I just want you to you guys to know that this list is not kind of exhaustive. It's just a good sort of frame of mind to have as you're evaluating these pieces of technology. Um, so if there are other things that sort of come to mind that fall under the bucket of it being human centric or community minded, like definitely feel free to add. Um, so what do I mean by human centric? Um, you know, like I said earlier, we're making things for people. And so I believe that people should always be first um, in the work. Remember that, you know, as advertisers, we've entered into this unspoken contract with our audiences. You know, they're giving us the gift of their attention. What are we giving them in return? So, you know, think about what value integrating a, speci a specific piece of technology is actually bringing to your audiences. Um, and then also think about things like accessibility, right? Like uh, people have different levels of tech literacy. If you're speaking to a specific audience that might be, you know, like a Gen Z audience, you know, uh, the sort of vernacular of gaming might be extremely easy and intuitive to them. But then if you compare that with like, I don't know, people who are like Gen X, like, asking them to like grab a remote and you know like a, a controller sorry and like you know navigate through something it might be a little bit more of a barrier so just keeping these things in mind who are we speaking to and what how can we ease their sort of uh learning curve i guess <clears throat> accessibility also might refer to the different markets that we're targeting you know is this um, is this a campaign that's only going to be in the UK? Is this a campaign that's going to be global? Are there different languages? Like all those things are, you know, also things to keep in mind. And does the tech allow for you to do things in different, you know, languages or sort of adapt for different cultures? And then I've already kind of hinted at this, but like, you know, thinking about the learning curve, thinking about how user friendly this piece of tech is. Are you designing an experience that uh, the sort of, um, allows for natural intuitive interactions um you know that people don't have to like go through like a huge list of instructions in order to get past um yeah just things like that again not an exhaustive list but you know i think a good one to sort of keep in mind um culturally resonant so this category or this lens i like to think about as you know uh what what is happening in the world at this moment or what's happening in the world or what do we think is happening in the world going to happen in the world when our experience launches like what are some contemporary needs and anxieties of our audiences what are some trends that are relevant um you know for example it's not a great idea to use um like touch screen technology you know it wasn't a good idea to use touch screen technology um right after covid because everybody was sort of you know still um, you know, I guess, traumatized by that whole experience. So that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, and then the last one, community minded. I find that, you know, oftentimes when we create experiences, we're always so focused on the sort of main experience, but don't really allow for um, a kind of dialogue to happen between participants after they sort of come out of the experience. So is there a way that the tech that we choose can foster dialogue and interaction amongst audiences. And then also another thing to keep in mind, um, depending on your specific execution, is how can we involve local communities in a meaningful and authentic way um, if we're involving them um, in the project. All right, um, so now that we've talked about uh, our key, des key experience design principles, I'm just gonna go over very quickly, a kind of overview of the current creative technology landscape. Um, I'm not going to go in depth into all of this because we don't have time. I'm going to do a deep dive in uh, artificial intelligence later and we can sort of, uh, you know, use our three experience design principles to sort of break down artificial intelligence together. Um, but I will sort of talk briefly about all these little buckets. Um, big caveat, I am by no means a technologist. Um, this is just an overview of the different categories of technology that I've seen be used um, or that are being talked about in the advertising space currently. So um, if you guys have 
you know, more specific tech questions about any of these things, you can ask me later. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to shoot them off to one of my, you know, um, smarter techie friends and then hopefully give you guys an answer later on through email. Um, okay, so very, very quickly, um, we'll start with virtual reality. Um, for those of you guys who have not experienced it yet, this is a sort of um, headset based experience, um, mostly, uh, where you are sort of fully immersed in a completely virtual um, 3D world. And, um, you know, you're going to have the ability to sort of like walk through the space, um, depending on your headset. Um, there's, you know, a certain level of interactivity. Um, and it, it really feels that you're being immersed in a new um, world. You don't have the ability to really see your current environment. Um, you're completely sort of transported. Um, for the second category, augmented reality is kind of like the, I guess, the cousin or the sibling of virtual reality. Um, but this is, you know, an experience where basically you have um, a view of your existing environment, but virtual objects or sounds even are sort of realistically embedded within the scene, creating a sort of seamless, cohesive experience. Um, the spectrum of augmented, real uh, augmented reality really ranges. So the sort of low end of the spectrum, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, are like your TikTok, Snapchat, um, Instagram, AR filters. Um, all the way to more robust applications like the Siguros visualizer that I um, shared with you guys on Magic Leap. Um, or artificial intelligence, we'll talk about later. Um, huh, NFTs. Uh, I mean, I guess we can still talk about NFTs. They're still, they're not dead. Um, they're just, you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if any clients are asking for NFTs anymore, but I guess I'll just talk about it. For those of you guys who are not so familiar, um, NFT stands for non-fungible tokens, and they're essentially unique digital assets that represent ownership of a specific item or asset. Um, they're called non-fungible because they can't be exchanged for something of equal value, um, and they can represent like a huge range of different assets like art, collectibles, um, in-game items or music, and they're stored in a blockchain. So that um, allows for secure ownership verification and transfer and are accessible by a crypto wallet. Um, all right, real-time animation. This one is an interesting kind of tech application, especially for brands that have um, animated sort of mascot characters or for IPs that have, um, uh, yeah, animated sort of 3D characters. Um, really what you're, basically what it is, is um, leveraging motion capture technology to essentially puppet um, your 3D character in real time. So it really opens up this world of you being able to have, um, you know, really live interactions with an audience or a fan base through this character, um, which wouldn't be, possible with a sort of, um, you know, traditional animation pipeline, which is, you know, locked. Um, again, the sort of range is quite wide. So, you know, you can have stuff like what we have in the image here, where um, the woman is controlling the monkey through um, just her sort of facial, um, facial gestures. And then you can have it to like, you know, like full on like mocap suit puppeting, like a real sort of like full body character. Um, we did something for the Game Awards where I think we we sort of used an Apex Legends character to sort of crash the Game Awards, and then they had a little bit of banter with the audience, banter with the um, banter with the the host. So um, yeah, it's just interesting, especially for um, brands with that type of IP. Uh, the next category: biometric wearables. This category sort of. Um, uh, I would think of it in concert with data visualization. So basically, you know, biometric wearables are things like your Fitbit, your Apple Watch, all the way to something that's a little bit more robust, like the Muse headband that you see in the image there. Um, and basically, it's pulling all this data from your body and sort of, you know, um, giving you the ability to sort of analyze it and break it down. And why I say it's important to pair it with data visualization, because it can make you know, it can, it basically makes the internal world um, visible for everybody to see. So 
I think there's some really interesting applications, especially for brands that, um, you know, are very focused on the sort of like the emotion that people feel when they, you know, that they, yeah, that people want to associate with the brand. So, you know, if you, um, I don't know, like want to feel the exhilaration of like driving in a car, for example, like, is there a way that we can use biometrics to sort of pull data from someone who's driving that and sort of make it into this abstract, beautiful, you know, um, art piece or to have it sort of projected on the walls. Uh, we did this, um, uh, this experience for a sportswear brand where we created this immersive yoga studio and we had everyone wear biometrics and we basically projected all their live biometrics through like, you know, we sort of translated that into abstract visuals and projected that onto the walls. And so it was really an amazing experience that enhanced the focus of everybody's, um, you know, their, yeah, enhanced their focus while they were doing the yoga. Um, and it just, you know, it's a completely unique experience because no two people's biometrics are the same. So that's like a once, I guess, in a lifetime yoga experience. Um, the last category, um, kind of in the same bucket as the, you know, NFTs, the metaverse. I don't know who's talking about this anymore. It's still not dead. Paris Hilton launched her sliving land on Roblox like last year. So it's again, still not dead. Um, but what's interesting to me is when I talk about the metaverse to um, like younger creatives, they're all just like, isn't it just online gaming? And at this point, you know, without interoperable worlds or interoperable programs, it kind of is. So I would say like things like Fortnite and Roblox, these are like your current proto, proto metaverse experiences where you're able to inhabit a character, an avatar, you know, buy different items, socialize with your friends, you know, do different activities in a sort of virtual space. Um, yep, that's, I guess, where I was. I'll stop bashing the metaverse now. Okay, so we're going to do a deep dive on artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, I am not going to attempt to define AI. I'm going to let IBM do that for me. So um, AI basically leverages computers and machines to mimic the problem solving and decision making capabilities of the human mind. At this moment, AI is sort of trained to perform very specific tasks. These range from, you know, you asking your Amazon Alexa or your Siri, you know, what's the weather like today? Like, you know, how's the traffic like that, that kind of stuff, all the way to um, more robust applications that say like an IBM Watson X would do for um, enterprise scale um, challenges for very specific like industry level like, challenges. And then you have your OpenAI's ChatGPT and DALI 3, which I'll sort of dive in deeper today. And that's your um, uh, generative AI. So um, based on some of you guys' uh, responses, I feel like, you know, you guys understand. I mean, like some of you guys like really understand generative AI. But for those who don't, I'm just going to do a little bit of a primer. So generative AI basically has the unique ability to generate new original content by learning from huge amounts of data. So this content ranges from text and image to even music. Um, ChatGPT um, is a very specific example um, that understands and generates natural language text. So it's trained on you know, a huge amount of data and it can provide human-like responses and allows users to engage in a natural uh, sort of conversational interaction with it. Um, so it's very sort of user-friendly and easy to use. Um, so I have the example on the left is a super early creative ex uh, example from ChatGPT. This is back in like 2022, I think. And, you know, people were extremely impressed by its ability to mimic the human tone of voice. So basically in this prompt, the guy just asked to, you asked ChatGPT to write a Bible verse explaining how to take a peanut butter sandwich out of a VCR machine. And it does a pretty good job. Um, and the one on the right, this is like early Dali. Um, as you can see, it's like <laughs> trying very hard, like the reins still don't really match up. The hooves look a little bit funky. 
Um, but you know, a lot has changed in the last year for AI, especially for ChatGPT and DALI three. Um, now, ChatGPT's practical applications have really exploded. It has plugins with the likes of Expedia, Instacart, um, Canva, OpenTable um, to help us expedite otherwise very laborious tasks. So you can ask ChatGPT Plus to suggest a vegan restaurant for a specific date and time and it's going to give you a recommendation and it's going to direct you to the exact link that you need to um, make that reservation on, on OpenTable. Um, through Canva, you're going to be able to... Um, you know, uh, sorry, through the Canva plugin um, and its integration with DALI 3, which is the image generator, um, text to image generator, um, you can generate, you know, new logos for brands just by a text prompt. So that's pretty crazy. And then um, this is the latest sort of announcement. Well, not latest, like end of last year. OpenAI basically um, announced that ChatGPT is able to see and hear. So basically it's integrated voice and image capabilities. So, you know, in this example that they showed, you're able to send it a picture of your bicycle and ask it to lower the seat for you. And it's going to analyze you know, the, the image and be able to give you contextual um, instructions based on that image. So that's pretty wild. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, it's, ChatGPT especially has greatly popularized the everyday use of AI and this has set off like a huge arms race within big tech. It's become nearly impossible to keep up with the daily announcements and new upgrades and innovations within this space. Um, you know, and every platform is trying to find its like unique take on AI with some finding more success than others. Um, this is not new, but like when it first came out, these are basically um, Meta's interactive social profile, like AI social profiles. When I saw this, I was really like, this is like, un this is like the next level of uncanny valley. And I, I don't know, I just think it's really freaky, but basically um, they've taken like the likeness of different um, celebrities. I'm sure that they're, you know, paying them shit tons of money. Um, and they've created these unique personas that are not the celebrity, but it's like a separate persona, but it's driven by the AI likeness of famous celebrities. So if you go onto like, I don't know, fake Paris Hilton's uh, Instagram and Facebook, you're going to see posts, um, videos of them. And it's some of like, if you're used to seeing AI generated imagery, some of the images you can tell are not real, but then when they start speaking, like it's very, very uncanny. And the thing is like the fact that you know that this is not real, I don't know. It just kind of set me in a weird spiral. I was like, I also, I don't want to think about the reasons why Meta released this and what they're trying to um, profit from. But yeah, well, that's a different talk. Um, okay. so. Kind of a good segue into this section where I talk about how um, you know it's these this technology also has limitations. You know, um, uh, I'm sure you guys know AI datasets are notoriously biased. Even though they're trying to improve them all the time, they're still you know. For example, the Guardian last year had a report about how AI algorithms objectify women's bodies routinely. Sometimes it can be straight up wrong. If you guys have used ChatGPT recently, uh, the, the, like, the text box that you use to type in your prompts, underneath that, it, there's a disclaimer that says ChatGPT can be wrong. Please check um, whatever they come up with. Um, also, it can be harmful. Um, this is a Deutsche Telekom ad um, by Adam and Eve DDB that highlights the dangers of posting our, our children's pictures um, publicly online and what people are going to be able to do um, to sort of scam you or, you know, so there have been like a rise in AI voice scams where people um, or scammers are taking publicly available audio clips and creating AI generated sound bites um, from people and using them to trick their family and friends. So, you know, there's a lot of concern about this stuff, but this, like I said, this space is changing rapidly almost every day. Um, there's huge calls for regulation and stricter controls. Um, you know, Joe Biden had his executive order uh, in an attempt to manage the risks related to AI. So 
Um, this is definitely a space to keep watching because I just feel like it's, it's endlessly fascinating, um, very ex- uh, sort of uh, triggers a lot of existential crisis, but also, you know, very exciting as well. So with all that kind of in mind, I'm just going to, you know, uh, sort of go back to the previous section and think about our three experience design principles um, and see how we can use them to assess, you know, how suitable generative AI might be for your specific creative challenge. So um, the way that I'm going to do this is I'm just going to go through the different categories and, you know, I'm going to Basically, this is just how I would, I guess, break down generative AI if I were to use it for something like so. Um, these are just some questions that I would ask um, through these different lenses. So for a human centric um, first question, how does incorporating generative AI enhance my audience's experience? Is it a plus? Is it a minus? Am I just jumping on the bandwagon because it's a gimmick like, you know, you have to ask yourself those hard questions. And also sometimes if like, if, you know, if your client is really insistent on it, there are ways to sort of break it down and, you know, try to explain whether or not, you know, if you think it's a bad idea and it's not going to work, like there are ways to sort of like gently sort of bring them around. But, you know, just reminding them that your audience and it being valuable to your audience is like the key. I think that's very important. That's a very important argument. Um, Second sort of set of questions, I guess, is like, how will my audience engage with AI in this experience? Is there going to be a steep learning curve for them? Who is my audience? Like, what's their tech literacy? And also like thinking about accessibility. Am I asking people to uh, uh, type prompts out? Um, is there a way for me to, you know, help differently abled individuals and, um, you know, have a sort of speech module or the other way around? Um, so for culturally resonant, a few questions that sort of came off the top of my head. Um, what's the current cultural perception of AI? Um, and then a sub question to that, which I thought was interesting is, depending on your creative challenge, is there a difference in perception within the specific community I am targeting and like the broader sort of like, I guess, general public's opinion of AI? Because that could be quite, you know, uh, it could be quite different. And then another question, I guess, is how is AI being used in the industry vertical that my client is a part of? Are there competitors who are using it in an effective way? Is there sort of any white space for me to um, capitalize on AI? Or is it sort of like a really overused thing in the industry vertical um, that my client is in? Or is there maybe like nobody in the space that's sort of pioneering um, and using generative AI um, for my particular vertical? And then you can also, you know, look to other industry verticals to see interesting executions and see if there's any learnings that you, ha you can um, glean and sort of port them over to, um, to help your client out. And then lastly, community minded. Um, so can generative AI, uh, you know, can integrating generative AI make my experience a communal one? Um, oftentimes, you know, the challenge with AI is that, or the challenge specifically with generative AI is that it's very prompt based, right? And so is there a way to make the prompt like creation process a collaborative one? Is that, you know, is that, uh, additive to my, um, the experience that I'm trying to create. And then another, um, another question specifically for generative AI, I guess, is like, are there any communities that are interested in AI that I can connect my audience with? Um, is that beneficial for my audience? All right. So now that I've talked your ears off, um, about generative AI, I am for the last part of this um, talk going to do a little um, project walkthrough uh, just to show you guys the sort of strategic experience design framework in action um, and apply to a real brief. So this was something that I did quite a while back for HBO for their show Lovecraft Country. And so for you, I mean, it's, I don't think it was very, it kind of made its way over to the UK. But basically the show follows this black family 
um, as they travel through 1950s Jim Crow America in search of the protagonist's missing father. There was this, um, it's a very genre bending show. So um, while they're battling, you know, the racist terrors of white America at that time, they're also battling the sort of cosmic horror Lovecraftian monsters along the way. It's a very interesting genre bending show and I highly recommend it. Um, so the brief from HBO, um, because they're really um, focused on appearing as a very innovative brand, um, they wanted us to create a technologically innovative experience to generate buzz for the new show and to foster a fandom amongst potential audiences. So um, before we came to our sort of creative execution or ideas for the uh, creative ideas for the um, for the brief, we wanted to take a look at the sort of cultural landscape at it, as it stood. And this was a sh this was a project that we did at the height of the pandemic. So, you know, everybody was it was peak COVID lockdown in the US. Everybody was having work from home cabin fever, feeling isolated and alone. And at the same time, you know, everyone was getting more socialized to the idea of hanging out online. So virtual gatherings on Zoom, virtual events, the metaverse, this was all sort of popping off at that time. And then considering our audience, just because we needed this to sort of gain a lot of traction, we wanted to target mainstream press, um, pop culture, uh, influencers, and also the blurred community. Um, and, you know, thinking about what they needed at the time, uh, just because everyone was sort of trapped in their own houses, we figured escape is entertainment and a way to connect with other people, like-minded people. Um, and finally, where are they? They're at home. Um, and then, you know, we also ask ourselves the question, how do we want our audiences to feel? And because we were, we wanted to create something that would get a small, group of people to evangelize, you know, feel compelled to evangelize their own communities and really, um, you know, get the word out there about the show. We wanted to make sure that the, whatever we created was very relevant to their interests um, and that they could see parallels between their own personal interests and the show's themes and characters. Um, and of course, we wanted them to feel genuinely entertained. So the idea we ended up coming up with that HBO loved um, is this VR virtual event series uh, for influencers that was going to run alongside the episodes as they aired and featured original programming inspired by the show's themes. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the different types of technology that we ended up integrating to facilitate this experience. Um, we chose the to optimize the experience to the MetaQuest headset because that was you know the most popular um, headset around. It had like oh, well over a million like estimated unit sales. Um, and it's very simple and intuitive for people to set up and to use um, as their sort of first VR headset. And then for the platform we wanted to host this on, we, we chose VR Chat just because it's free to use, it's multi-user, it's a multi-user social VR platform. And what I mean by that is that it like, it, you know, it allows multiple people to be in the same VR sort of space at once concurrently. And you can sort of talk to people, walk up to people, engage with them um, in a very sort of natural way. Um, it also allowed us to build custom high fidelity virtual world and avatars, which is extremely important or was extremely important for HBO just because they are, you know, premier television brand and they like the like high fidelity visuals is super important to them. And then finally, because it's an influencer event, we wanted to open it up to um, a broader audience as well. And that's why we decided to live stream it and have a sort of interactive live stream through YouTube live. So Sort of thinking about the experience through the different lenses, um, I think talk about human centric first, we obviously wanted to put the guest at the center of the experience. So this was a remote influencer event and we were very concerned with creating the most seamless and hassle free experience as possible, which included sending every single influencer um, a MetaQuest headset. Um, we set up a, a helpline for everybody to sort of, you know, who, for anyone to sort of call and reach out to if they had trouble setting it up um, or troubleshooting the sort of login process. Um, also, because we knew that 
you know, not everybody is um, used to social VR. It can be a very overwhelming experience to jump into a virtual room. It's very vulnerable. If you feel very vulnerable because anybody can sort of walk up to you and talk to you. Um, and, you know, unlike in sort of a physical space, you can sort of walk away, but there like gravity doesn't exist. So the person sort of comes up quite quickly towards you. And it's very disorienting, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So if you're not prepared, it's a little bit um, daunting. So in order to sort of get over that, we curated the experience such that we um, had groups of 10 experience the, ex uh, the sort of VR event at, at a time. So we had um, s a small guided experience that was led by a guide um, that uh, was trained by the mill. And so when you entered the room, you not only had your nine other participants, but you also had a single docent that was like clearly marked as a docent. So that person could guide you through the experience, could help you um, with a specific interaction if you were having trouble and just be, you know, uh, there to help you out. So that sort of like eases that, I guess, anxiety. Um, and we also made sure to keep the groups the same for every event. So everybody ended up making friends. It was very cute because there was another, there was one event I remember where um, we had a sort of debrief with all the guides afterwards. And one of the guides said, my group like really bonded and they went off to try other VR chat worlds by themselves after the event. And these are people that didn't know them, didn't know each other before um, they were invited. So really cool. Um, culturally resonant, again, like going back to um, the sort of, I guess, current needs and anxieties of people, um, we felt like it was important to make this extremely transportive. So the worlds were very, um, were very vast and uh, otherworldly. You know, again, the great thing about VR is that, like I said, gravity doesn't exist. Like you can do so many different things that you can't do in the real world to make it feel um, unique and um, very sort of magical. Um, and also, like I said before, it's a, it was a social experience. So everybody was able to talk to each other, um, discuss um, what was happening. Um, we had really interesting programming. We, the first was like an Afrofuturist art installation like show. That's what you're seeing um, on the screenshot here. We had like a spoken word performance inspired by the words of James Baldwin. And then finally, we had a, a crazy concert performance by Janelle Monet. So, you know, everybody being able to party together, especially at a time that was extremely, you know, depressing and you're not being able to be together with people, um, we thought was very valuable. And then finally, community minded, um, you know, we, like I said before, this was uh, a sort of closed influencer event just because we needed to, it's very expensive to send headsets out to people, but also we wanted to sort of make sure that it would, um, <laughs> We wouldn't break the platform by having too many people during the first event. But once we saw that we could handle the load, we opened up the second and third events to any fan with the Quest headset. We just opened up more rooms, trained more docents, and um, you know brought more, pe more people through the experience. And then um, for the fans that didn't have headsets, because you know not everybody has a VR headset lying around in the house, um, we created um, a custom interactive live stream for them so people we would have um, on-screen puzzles that would come on and um, through the chat people would answer sort of solve the riddles together and the first person to solve the riddle would get like a shout out on the screen and also affect a kind of like there would be a visual sort of trigger on the screen that um, they managed to unlock for the entire live stream so that was very cool okay so that's my whistle stop tour of how to sort of think more strategically about creative technology. And if, you know, you didn't sort of take in anything, I guess like the final really, the final takeaways would be that um, after, after all, like technology is simply a tool for us to use and, you know, to remember to always keep the human experience at the heart of creative technology. Like I said before, it's a very, a natural thing for people to grapple with. So just using a little bit of empathy and you know trying to put yourself in other people's shoes as you're developing your experience is always gonna be the way to go. Uh, thanks, that's me. Um, 
if you have any questions or follow-ups or whatever, my email's at the bottom. Uh, feel free to um, connect. But yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Um, I mean, I guess the sort of big trend at the moment is, you know, very obviously AI, but just seeing how that evolves um, and seeing, because right now the way that we interact with AI is very text-based, right? Like typing in a prompt and maybe sort of speaking, um, you know, because I said now ChatGPT Plus has the ability to like hear you speak. So, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see the different sort of like interfacing technologies that people are going to come up with to make it more accessible to people or just more natural and intuitive. Because I think people, there's still a lot of people who are very freaked out by it. So I just feel like there's going to be this trend towards making it almost, I mean, in a lot of ways, AI is already invisible. There's so many products that we use every day that already incorporate AI. But this type of AI, like, I don't know, just making it more invisible, I think is something that can be, um, that will be interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that that, so either you can, you know, use Photoshop and comps just to sort of demonstrate the sort of placing of things, but then you can also use very sort of simple prototypes. Um, I think it really depends on what uh, platform you're trying to do it for. Like, is it going to be on mobile? Is it going to be um, like a headset experience? Um, and, um, I think also sort of familiarizing yourself with the with the limitations of the technology that you're using just so that you're not suggesting something in a comp that can't be done on like the device that you're trying to target or the platform that you're trying to use. So a lot of times when we do, um, for example, social AR filters for um, clients, they want like really crazy sort of ex uh, like a very robust experience but the reality is that we're just using your f a phone so kind of familiarizing yourself with whatever limitations exist within the technology and then transferring that into a comp and then also having a little list to explain like why it is the way that it is right now um just so to like help help their sort of learning curve so that's like a longer answer than what you asked for, but I hope that helps. Honestly, I, I, yeah, I, I, I feel like, I, like I said, going back to the premise of the talk, like making sure that it's something that is actually bringing value to people, really understanding your audience and how this specific technology is going to give them an experience that only this technology can give them. Or, um, uh, yeah, just because, I don't know. I think it's it's very like I said before. It's very obvious when something is just being the retrofitted um, into an execution, but it not have any sort of like relevance to the audience. Um, I think it's it's pretty obvious once you sort of go through the idea and break it down and see what the results are for your audience. Um, so I think that that that's really the main thing that I can say is that connect it being actually something of value for your audience. You know, I think working with people, um, technologists who are really familiar with the technology, its limitations, its sort of advantages um, is very important um, just because it's there's nothing worse than just I don't know, trying to come up with this idea and try to sell it in without knowing whether or not it's technically feasible and also working with people who um working with people who maybe can sort of guide you as to like how far you can push a specific tech piece of technology because the thing with innovation sometimes especially in like advertising we have very short timelines um so you know working with people who kind of understand, okay, this is where the tech is at right now, but 
I know within three months or six months down the line, this particular feature is going to be launched for this product or platform. And we can therefore, at this point, start building this sort of dream experience that the client wanted. I think this sort of like technological road mapping is also quite helpful, um, again, to manage clients' expectations. Because um, like I said, sometimes what they want is like, it's just way out of reach. And just trying to bring them back down to earth um, to create something that they're happy with or to maybe inspire them to be bold and give give you guys like a longer time timeline to sort of prototype and iterate and figure out if there's a different solution um, with maybe cobbling together different pieces of technology to sort of figure out um, if their desired end result can be achieved. Um, but, you know, I think bottom line, it's it's all about clear, transparent communication with your client and getting them to trust you that you are the expert and that, um, you know, um, because, you know, a lot of times people are really sort of they're they're also kind of they I don't know, they're there's a bit of fear, like they don't really know, like they just want a firm hand to sort of like guide them through this process of innovation. So I think trying to be there for them in that way and communicating with them clearly um, and being very transparent about the process, about what you know and what you don't know. I think that's very helpful.